Hello everyone, welcome back. So, true stress and strain. You're like, okay, wait, you said engineering stress and strain. What's this? Well, engineering stress and strain did something weird. What we saw was that after we reached the necking point, the amount of stress actually decreased with strain. And that doesn't make much sense. You're like, well, why is strain increasing? If we're not increasing the stress, shouldn't it go down? And I told you at the time, well, that's because it's the machine that's measuring the force. And so the force that it's feeling resisting it is decreasing. However, the cross-sectional area of that thing is necking now, and so it's decreasing a lot more. So in all honesty, the true stress does increase all the way to failure. Okay, it does increase all the way to failure. And even the strain actually goes a bit further than that. Like it's, the real true strain is actually more than what we see. So how do we get this true stress and true strain? Well, to get it, we would have to know the instantaneous cross-sectional area or the instantaneous length of my object. Now, just looking at it at the end after it's failed, but looking at it all along the way. And you would use these equations. Now, these are good all the time until failure. However, at least until we reach that necking point. So in that plastic deformation region right here, we can convert between our regular stress, what we know, and our true stress, and our regular strain, which we can calculate more easily, and our true strain, until that necking point. As an additional caveat, this only works if the volume is constant. Okay, volume of the material is constant. If it's not, you can't use these equations. So you would default back to these. You don't have, we don't do this very much, but you can sometimes, so be prepared for that. So with that in mind, um, you can convert by simply multiplying it by this factor, which is just one plus the strain. Okay, now for some metals, there is a nice little function here that you can use sometimes to calculate the true stress. Once again, this is only before the onset of necking. After that point, things get really wonky, and the only way you can do it is to take that instantaneous area with the instantaneous length to figure out everything else. But what we see here is there's this nice little function that can very well describe our true stress, true strain relationship before necking. So these N and K values, they depend on the alloy and the treatment. How has it been treated? So the N is our strain hardening exponent. And N is usually less than one. What we see though, is that as we have larger Ns, well, there is a much larger amount of stress that it takes to cause deformation. While with a lower N, deformation is sudden and extreme when we reach that plastic deformation point. Before this, it's just Hooke's law. This is only for that plastic deformation region. So sometimes we'll be called to do this and we might be given values of N and K to be able to calculate how the true stress and true strain are related. Okay, now plastic deformation, we've mentioned this maybe once before, but there is something called elastic strain recovery. Because you know, initially, we increase it all the way up to our yield strength. Your yield strength is right up here. And we could decrease if we want to. And after we have passed that yield strength, and we've gone all the way up here, well, we, it's no longer elastic, now we're doing plastic deformation, and that is gonna cause it to be permanently longer. Now, how much longer is it gonna be? Well, that's a bit more difficult to decide, because you might think, oh, it's just gonna go straight down, it's gonna stay that same length forever. But that's not the case, it will actually bounce back. And if you look at these two lines, what do you notice? They look parallel, and they are parallel. Your metal, all the way up to necking and failure, or sorry, before necking, will always unload in the exact same way that it loads. So it will unload along a linear line, just like when it's in that elastic region. And also, interestingly, wherever you went before, like this stress, that becomes your new elastic limit. After you have put plastic deformation in there, this is your new elastic limit. And the amount of strain that is recovered right here, that's the elastic strain recovery. It's simply, I take where I end, and I drag a line back that is parallel to my initial slope, and wherever that ends, 
based on where I was before, that's my elastic strain recovery. So this is helpful. This is what is work hardening. It's saying I've gotten stronger, so it takes more stress for me to have plastic deformation now. But also I'm getting closer and closer and closer to that necking point. Once I reach that necking point, it's not getting stronger anymore. It's just breaking, it's failing. So until that point though, I'm getting stronger and I have a longer and longer elastic region. But eventually I reach the point where, you know, if I go anything past this, it's no longer going to have any more to move. It's just going to fail instantly if it goes past the elastic limit. That's like with a, um, like a, a coat hanger, if you've ever bent it back and forth a bunch of times. Eventually it gets to really, really hard, but then it just snaps suddenly. That's because you reach the point where you would work hard it to the point where there was no give anymore. It, as long as it was in that elastic region and it didn't you know, go outside of that elastic region, it's fine. But if it went a step out of it, just a, barely out of it, it would fail. And so every time we do this, we get a new yield strength. And when we unload it, um, it can go up there. And when we load it again, if we get past that point, we're going to have some more plastic deformation. So that's it for this time. Thank you for listening. I hope it helps you. And I'll see you later.